I, I guess I should start off by saying that the, uh, I typically, when I, I'm an internist, um, primary care doc at Mass General, and, um, and uh, in addition to the, my administrative work and the health economics research that I do, I, uh, I actually am invited to a lot of specialty societies to talk about payment systems. And uh, I have to say that in the years that I've been doing this, I have never before seen a series of presentations given that so hit the nail on the head as the ones that you've just been. I, I feel like you guys are in great hands um, with terrific advisors, and, and I don't need to say anything. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so maybe I'll tell a few stories about what's going on in the, in the broader environment because, uh, because I, I, I just have to say it again, what you just heard, and I would say every specific point that you just heard, not one or two of them, but every single one of them are, were exactly right. Um, so, um, uh, so here's the, the big picture. This is uh, when I have to stand up in front of the uh, docs like Mike at Mass General, I frequently show this slide, um, which is what is the problem? Like, why are people complaining about costs in healthcare? So, this is the Massachusetts state budget as um, uh, in a bar graph from 01 to 14. And you can see on the far left, healthcare costs went up 37%. Um, percent, and everything else that the Massachusetts state government spends money on that is you can argue about whether or not any one of those is worthwhile, but everything was cut in order to pay higher health care costs. That's a problem. That is not sustainable. So whatever one thinks about which way the guns are pointed inward or outward, health care costs are a problem. Okay? Now, they may not be a problem for um, uh, echocardiography, but they are a problem in general. And therefore, I work in an organization that says we are about solving healthcare problems, and whether that's looking for new ways to image the heart, finding new um, opportunities to improve cardiac care, or it's addressing the healthcare cost problem. We gotta, that's a big problem, it's a challenge, we have to try to address it. So, we, what we are facing, what we believe we're facing, is constraining the growth of healthcare costs is a national priority. We can't keep laying off teachers in order to pay the health benefits of retired municipal employees, which is what happened in every single town in the United States in 2009. So, but those of us who are over 50, right, I won't ask you to raise your hands, um, uh, remembered we've been here before. What was the managed care 90s about? And boy, that was pretty much of a dismal failure, wasn't it? Um, it slowed the health care cost uh, growth actually nationally for about two years, and then it just went right back to where it was at about twice inflation. Um, and you know, doctors weren't very happy about it, and consumers weren't very happy about it. And so why, when my doctors at Mass General, when we talk, we say, but everyone who's over 50 says, why isn't this just going to be the same as last time? A couple of things are different. The economic issues here are different than they were in the 90s. The government is being proactive. This meeting is being held in a unique state in this regard. So Massachusetts is the only state in the country which has legislated the rate of rise of health care costs. It's sort of like um, legislating witchcraft. Um, I mean, it's a difficult thing to do, but they've actually said health care costs in Massachusetts cannot rise greater than the state domestic product. Now, they haven't actually figured out how to measure the state domestic product. They're working on it. Um, but it's basically the same as uh, GDP for the country. And what they're saying is don't grow faster than inflation. And who are they penalizing? They're penalizing everybody. The insurers, the providers, everyone's responsible, because they're all stakeholders in this game, for figuring out how we're going to keep health care costs at the rate of rise of inflation. Now think about this. What makes me optimistic about this situation is that's a big difference from the 90s. In the 90s, the government was not in the game. It was about commercial insurers and providers. And the commercial insurers were getting big cuts. In general, risk-based contracting is not about cutting, 
although there's an asterisk on that. It is, for a population, about increasing more slowly. In other words, last year, health care costs in Massachusetts went up at 2.7 percent. Okay? This year, they're going to go up at about 4.4 percent. It hasn't been announced yet, but that's about where the, what the number looks like. That's over the state cap, which was set at 3.6 percent. So whose problem is that? Well, at Partners Healthcare and Mass General, it's partly our problem. We're going to have to pay money back in order to keep us under that amount. But wait a sec, what caused that? It turns out that health care costs in general this past year went up in Massachusetts at around 3 percent. So we were under the 3 percent cap. What went up? Well, every year it's something different because we keep inventing stuff to do. I mean we in the big sense. And this particular last year was a big year for a new medication called Savaldi. So it's not every year that a new medication comes on the market that cures a disease, but that happened last year. Savaldi cures hepatitis C, and it costs a lot of money. And the amount of money that it costs is actually the increase over inflation in Massachusetts. And who's going to have to pay for that? Well, according to current state law, we are. Is that fair? Wait, so Gilead Pharmaceuticals is making, I, I, by the way, I, I have nothing to report in terms of conflict of interest. Um, uh, so, so shareholders of Gilead are going to make a lot of money. They're, they're actually, they're, they're, every quarter they're setting new records in the amount of money earned by a, um, a pharmaceutical company. And yet, we're going to have to pay the state back because our patients cost, wait, help me, this doesn't seem fair, does it? Right? This is the complicated world that we're moving into. So the economy's worse, the government is being proactive, and we're still working out how, how, how we get this Savaldi thing, how do we make that fair? And then, but here's some uh, notes of optimism. So the rate of change is slower, we're looking for caps on increases and not cuts. And we have much better data. You had a great presentation on benchmarking and the use of data. Uh, all I say is, yes, do more of that. And we actually know more about what actually works to increase uh, or, or to the value in healthcare. And I should say, um, uh, you also heard a great presentation about where you need to invest in order to improve value. Don't forget about that. That was great advice. We found that there are specific areas that we can invest in that actually reduce total cost of care, spending money to save money. So the policy approaches I won't go through in, in more detail. You actually saw a similar slide about the range of options, fee-for-service on the left, global payment on the right. The basic playbook here is pretty simple. The government is making the pain of staying in fee-for-service higher and higher, and then pulling you in through that same mechanism to uh, participation in one of these population programs or shared savings programs or bundled programs, whatever it is. I pretty much, I would say, again, you can't predict the future, I would say that pretty much everyone's future has some population-based payment, bundled payment in it because the pain of not participating is going to continue to grow. Um, so our challenges, when I say our challenges, I'm talking about a healthcare system. So how does a healthcare system look at this? Well, it's, a li it's quite complicated. So one, we need tactics that will be successful under any new payment models. This is really tricky. All three of our major commercial payers are taking a different approach to this. There is no standardization for figuring out how you calculate trend. The government, federal government, and the state government also calculate trend differently. How are we supposed to know what, what game we're playing if the rules are different with every different payer? Okay, that's a problem. So we need to figure out tactics that will be successful independent of the very specific details of the contracts that we're being asked to sign. The second thing is how to make external incentives meaningful to our physicians. 
This, again, is really tricky. This gets back to the managed care 90s. And I'll tell you a very quick story. So in 1995, when I was practicing in a health center um, associated with Mass General, a patient came into my office and said, I want an, an MRI of my head because I have a head, headache. They might have well said, I want an echo of my heart um, because I have chest pain. And, um, and I said, no, well, I did a full exam, did history. Really, you don't, you don't need an MRI of your head. And, and she said, oh, but my mother had one, and my neighbor had one, and they hung them on the wall. They're really pretty. You really, um, I really need an MRI. And I said, no, you really don't need an MRI. And then she said something that is extremely important to where we stand now in the national policy debate. She said, you are not ordering that MRI because you're going to make money off of not doing this test. And I had to think for a second. I picked up her chart because back then it was paper charts. And it said, tough, secure horizons. And I realized, yeah, she's in one of those capitated health plans. It's 1995. And if I had been in private practice and I had been honest with her, my answer would have had to have been, I will personally make money by not doing this test. But I was an employed physician, salaried employed physician. It didn't matter a whit to me in terms of my personal income, whether or not I got this test. I didn't think she needed the test. When I say how to make external incentives meaningful to our physicians, this is what I'm talking about. Because if, in the rush to implement these new payment policies, we put incentives on physicians, either ordering physicians or performing physicians, to stint on care, and the public is unaware and not along for that ride, we're going to have the same thing that happened as in the 1990s. It's going to be a big mess. And then the last thing is moving at the right pace. So I would say 90%, now that we know what we're doing, I would say 90% of our discussions are about pace. If we go too fast, we will lose the docs, and I will say all the clinicians, in the rush to implement. On the other hand, if we move too slowly and we don't succeed at reducing cost of care, at holding care under inflation as one benchmark, um, then the regulatory environment is going to come down even harder. And it would not be hard for the regulatory environment to come down harder. It's very simple. Actually, people complain about the length of the ACA legislation. Cost-cutting legislation can be one page. It doesn't need to be complicated. I would actually argue that complication is good for the providers of health care because simple is just cut. Just leave everything the way it is and just cut. That's a really easy way to cut health care costs. I don't think it would be good for patients, and I don't think it would be good for doctors. All right. So I'm going to now quick and say we've come up with a list of what we think is going to reduce health care costs, where we are investing. And I'm not going to go through this list, um, but this is where we are spending money. And this list, uh, which uh, we've published, is um, it, it's important because everything on this list is something that provides value to patients but is not paid for in fee-for-service health care. So wh basically what we're doing is we're taking our margin and investing our margin in things that the fee-for-service system does not pay for because it provides higher value health care. Okay? Lots of things, like virtual visits. You, you Actually, some of the things on here are just the general case of things that you already heard about um, earlier. I will say that the um, advanced decision support at the bottom and the data analytics, advanced decision support. So we are requiring many of our uh, physicians now that you can't order a study without, it has to go through the computer and you have to use decision support. And we are embedding all the AUCs in that decision support. It's worked brilliantly. We've got a lot of uh, great work that's been done uh, on this um, in Mike's shop. I'm going to just uh, finish by um, showing a provocative uh, slide or two, which is um, th 
this is a very interesting study. I just published this with a bunch of friends. I'm sort of a data nerd, and this is, um, this is a very nerdy paper published in um, uh, uh, American uh, College of Radiology journal that looks at every imaging test in the United States by the uh, modality and the, um, the disease category. And the size of each square is the cost at the population level of that study, okay? Echocardiography of every different imaging study in the United States, if you add them all up, and this isn't because it's the highest cost study, it's because of the volume times the cost, all right? There's a lot of echoes done in the United States. It turns out it's number one in terms of the highest cost, the amount of total dollars in the United States spent on a specific imaging modality. There are times when being number one is great. Another view of this, um, actually I'm going to show it this way. Um, this is actually here, the coloring, if you can see, yeah, you can see the coloring pretty well. It's actually variation at the population level. So what you want is less variation. So you want to be more green. And it, it turns out here that ultrasound is significantly less, there's significantly less variant than nuclear. So this is a, consistent with a slide you saw earlier. It's still not great. There's still quite a bit of variation. So very high cost and relatively high variation. And you end up with this slide. So this slide is, um, we, we actually were comparing different regions, Boston, Cleveland, Miami, and Orange County, um, and looking at the coefficient of variance on the left and the cost on the right. And you, you don't want to be in the middle upper right, right? And you'll see along the axis there are four tests that are essentially equivalent. Abdominal pelvic CT uh, is high cost, lower variance. Cardiac ultrasound, cardiac nuclear, and extremity ultrasound are the test. So if you are a policy person, you say an economist or an economist advising people in the legislature, you would say those are your target for policy reform. Um, and then, so this is, you all know this, um, if there are people here from Oregon or Miami, but um, this just shows the total costs of imaging, all images done using a comprehensive Medicare data set, um, and showing that in Eastern Oregon, they just image a whole lot less than Miami, and the rest of us are somewhere in between. These are extraordinary variations in the total use of imaging. And by the way, uh, mortality in Eastern Oregon is dramatically less than it is. So life expecting in Eastern Oregon is much, much higher than it is in Miami. And then I just wanted to uh, close with uh, um, just highlighting uh, work that I've been uh, very uh, proud to see at Mass General under uh, Mike's leadership and, and others in his group about the kind of decision support, appropriate use, all that stuff that you've been hearing. The more people are, are doing this work um, from my perspective, the better. It really helps me as an administrator when I'm thinking about value and the value provided to patients in healthcare. So thank you very much.